Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News contributors Dr. Holly Phillips and Dr. Tara Narula. First up, how to calculate your heart age. A new CDC report reveals 70% of Americans have a heart that is aging faster than they are, raising the risk for heart attacks and strokes. Tara, let's start with this whole concept of heart age. What is it exactly? Right, so the heart age is basically a way of telling you the health and age of your heart, which may not be the same as your chronologic age. <laughs> the idea is that it's a simple way for people to to understand their yeah. risk of heart attack and stroke and hopefully modify behaviors and lifestyle and make lifestyle changes that might lower their risk. And so the typically when you go to the cardiologist, they sit down and they discuss with you your risk. They usually will tell you you have a 5% risk of a heart attack or stroke right. in the next 10 years or a 20% risk. That's not that easy for people to wrap their minds around and it's not it's not that personal but everybody really understands the concept of age. So the way it's calculated is by taking your age, your gender, your systolic blood pressure, whether you're treated for high blood pressure, whether you're diabetic or smoke, and then either your body mass index or your HDL and your total cholesterol, mm -hmm. and you're given a number. So how do you do it? How does that calculate? How, do, how do you make the calculation? Well, it's a really simple online tool, which I think is a, a big part of its appeal. Uh, and basically, you put in some of those stats that, that uh, Dr. Tara just mentioned. And then it spits out what your heart's age is right. versus what your actual age is. So for example, for a 45-year-old woman who is a smoker, uh, who is overweight, but not diabetic and does not have high blood pressure, her heart age would be 61, even mm -hmm. though she's only 45 years old. And, but if you keep all of those same uh, modifiers and you put them in, but you change her to a non-smoker, yeah. her heart age drops down to 49. So you can see how this is kind of an easy to understand tool that might give you a little bit of motivation to say, wait, if I stop smoking, yeah. you know, my heart age will drop. Well, next up, a new study finds slacking off on sleep can make you sick. Researchers found people that get less than six hours of shut eye per night are four times more likely to catch the common cold. I feel validated in this, because as Anthony can attest, every time I have a rough week, I do get sick. But how did they actually test this? Yeah, and that's, that's very real. There's been a lot of interest recently in the link between sleep and our immune system. So this study really focused specifically on the common cold. Uh, what they did, they took 164 people, uh, and they followed the quality and quantity of their sleep for one week. And then the next week, they exposed them to the common cold using a nasal swab. Mm -hmm. And then they figured out who actually got the cold. So for people who slept an average of less than six hours the week before, they were 4.2 times more likely to catch the cold mm. than people who slept greater than seven. For people who slept less than five, they were 4.5 times more likely to get the common cold. What was most striking about this, though, was lack of sleep was the greatest predictor of whether you're going to get a cold. Uh, it was more important than your age, uh, than your stress levels, uh, than whether or not you smoked. A lot of other things that we would think would play into it, sleep was the most important. So Tara, why is six to seven hours then the tipping point, do we think? Yeah, so the science isn't really there to give us that exact answer. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society, two major groups, released a consensus recommendation two months ago that basically said that, that six hours or less of sleep is inadequate for the safety and health of American adults, and that everybody should be getting seven or more hours of sleep. They actually didn't even put an upper limit on that. Yeah. Um, in addition, you know, it's really been called a public health epidemic with more than one third of Americans not getting the amount of sleep they need. When it comes to getting sick, certainly we, we seem to understand that when you don't get enough sleep, your immune system doesn't function as it should. Mm -hmm. The cells in your body that are your defense network, they're not as active. And also you have increased levels of inflammation. Well, millions of Americans report they suffer from a sensitivity to gluten, a protein found in wheat and other grains. But a new study found just one-third of the people diagnosed with non-celiac gluten sensitivity actually felt symptoms when introduced to flour-containing gluten. This is confusing because so many things now are gluten-free. Why is it so commonly mistaken? Right. So there are really two separate conditions here, two separate entities. The first is one called celiac disease. It's a well-understood autoimmune disorder. It's actually fairly common. It has a genetic component. And for people who have that disease, they cannot tolerate gluten, which is a protein found in barley, wheat, rye, and some oats, at all. It causes inflammation in their, in their small intestine and a whole host of symptoms ranging from rashes to anemia. And the treatment is complete avoidance of gluten. This is something though that can be diagnosed clearly. You can do a small intestinal biopsy or blood tests and really figure out if someone has celiac disease. 
On the other hand, there's a different entity, which is called non-celiac gluten sensitivity. That's thought to be a more mild disorder, almost like an allergic sensitivity to gluten. Mm -hmm. um, and it's being used to explain symptoms like brain fog or lack of energy or mild digestive symptoms. Uh, the idea is that these people have a, a, a very slight sensitivity and if you take gluten out of their diet, they're going to feel better. The problem is there's not a clear diagnostic test for it mm -hmm. and it's become really trendy recently. So I think yeah. a number of people are being diagnosed with this disorder who don't actually have it. Okay, well I mean to Holly's point, Tara, it, we see these gluten-free diets becoming more and more popular, right. but I if you don't actually have a sensitivity, is there a health risk in these diets? So there can be risks, Anthony, actually. You know, one of the big ones is deficiencies of important vitamins and minerals. So mm -hmm. when you eat a gluten-free diet, you might be missing out on B vitamins, on iron, on calcium, zinc. In addition, you may be missing out on healthy gut bacteria that we know is important for our immune system. You may not be getting enough fiber, which is not only important for the health of your bowels, but for weight management, for cardiovascular disease prevention. And then also, a lot of these gluten-free foods, in order to make them taste good, they're packed with sugar and fat and sodium, and so you may end up packing on the pounds. Right. And lastly, there's a risk to your wallet. So a lot of these gluten-free foods are right. actually very expensive. expensive.